Makahanya Haramita Shin Yoga Ganji Zai Bosa Yoshinya Haramita Welcome to this uh, podcast and uh, today we're going to be uh, starting a, a new series um, of podcasts that will run alongside the uh, regular Dharma talks. Uh, this one uh, is going to be the first in a series of troubleshooting uh, podcasts. So what we're going to do is to look at uh, various subjects, various questions to do with the practice of either Zazen, mindfulness, daily life practice, uh, anything really that comes up as far as the Buddha's teachings are concerned as well. Um, and uh, I'm going to do my best to provide some answers uh, to those questions. So obviously this is going to require some participation from our podcast listeners. So if you do have a question with regard to Zen Buddhist practice, uh, that's Zazen, mindfulness, daily life practice, uh, aspects of practice, reflection, um, anything to do with uh, the teachings of the Buddha, whether it's from the uh, mainstream early teachings or from the Mahayana or from the Zen school, uh, recommended reading, that sort of thing, or, or anything, or you just want to chime in, perhaps with a comment about something uh, that you found as in your own practice, maybe uh, problems arising or questions that are arising as uh, a result of either study or practice, then do please send them in. You can send them to the Zen Gateway at gmail.com. That's the Zen Gateway at gmail.com. Uh, or you can go to the uh, main page at uh, www.thezengateway.com. Uh, and along the top menu, you will see contact. Press that contact button, you will find our details there um, as well. So uh, do hope you will uh, participate. Uh, and to get uh, everything off to a start, thought today would have a look at problems surrounding the practice of Zazen. Uh, this is perhaps uh, the one practice that, that people do uh, find some difficulties with and do have quite a few questions about. Uh, obviously the Zen school is called the meditation school and Zazen, Za meaning sitting and Zen uh, being a transliteration of the uh, uh, Sanskrit word dhyana which means the practice of meditation so Zazen is sitting meditation uh, in Japanese, I uh, thought we'd have a look at some common questions that have arisen. Obviously, these have not been sent in, but these uh, are, have been collected uh, as a result of uh, uh, questions, genuine questions that people have asked uh, in the past in, in terms of, of training in uh, practicing Zazen. If you want to uh, sort of more how-to instructions uh, about the practice of Zazen. I'll put a link to a further podcast that I did quite some time ago uh, on how to do it um, so that uh, uh, if you need the instructions you can go through that. Of course if you've signed up to our newsletter uh, then you automatically get a, a podcast to download uh, which gives you instructions on how to set up uh, a meditation practice. That is Zazen. So we'll go straight in and the first question uh, has to do with form and posture uh, and this has to do with uh, sitting uh, meditation on the ground uh, and the question was do you have to get both knees on the ground uh, if you if you have a look at people in who, who sit in a zendo you'll notice that the seat that's given on the ground it comprises of a square mat usually it's sort of dark blue in color uh, that's because there are a limited number of colors that are permissible in most sendos either black gray or dark blue and dark blue seems to be quite a common color uh, and then you have on top of that you might have uh, one of two types of cushions one is called a zafu 
that ZAFU, and that is a small round black, usually black, uh, cushion that's pleated, uh, that's stuffed with kapok, and probably stands about five, six inches high. Uh, the other alternative is what's called a zabuton, which is a small quilt, a small square quilt that's folded over uh, and looks a little bit like a, a wave if you uh, at the back of the square mat. Uh, and both of those are to provide the buttocks with some extra height uh, that tips the pelvis forward so that the pelvis is above the knees the idea being that you get both knees onto the ground and uh, this is a sometimes a bit of a concern if we're not that flexible and we find that one knee uh, doesn't quite reach to the ground does it actually matter probably I mean if you're talking about uh, just doing a one period uh, it probably doesn't matter too much though just to be clear if you're sitting in a formal zendo uh, there's often you'll often find that there's not much leniency given to changes in form uh, the zen school has quite a, a strong emphasis on conf conforming to the form of the place and that also applies to the sitting posture and if we can't get both knees on the ground in for example if we're sitting cross-legged either in the half lotus position or the Burmese position the Burmese position is where you don't put the uh, one foot up on uh, the other leg you actually have the two uh, uh, foreleg parts of the foreleg they're actually parallel to each other they're lying horizontally parallel to each other on the cushion in front of you but you're still sitting cross-legged so if you're if you find that you cannot get both knees on the ground uh, and you want to sit on the ground you want to keep sitting on the ground um, then you can try uh, one other position which is to sit sort of a stride as it were as if you were sort of riding a horse that's on your knees but with the knees apart uh, unlike when we chant uh, what's the position is called sesa that's where you sit with the knees together and you sit back on the heels uh, and the feet are usually resting on the zafu or the zabuton uh, so they're raised up so that the uh, the front of your legs the top of your legs are sloping will be sloping down uh, so if you're sitting uh, astride, uh, you can either use uh, a zafu. Uh, you, uh, if you're on a zabuton, you'll need to use a zafu or something else underneath uh, in order to give you that little bit of, of height. Uh, normally, if you're sitting on that zafu, the round black cushion, uh, then you have the feet and the bottom part of your legs uh, parallel on the square mat on the floor. Um, the alternative to that is that some zendos do allow you to use a bench, a simple piece of equipment uh, made of wood, uh, one horizontal and two supporting vertical slats. Usually the horizontal is uh, upholstered in black material, again with kapok in to sort of match the zafu colour. Uh, and then you can sit on that uh, with your legs underneath. Uh, so that's uh, a more comfortable alternative if you want to. Uh, otherwise, uh, you may be required to sit on a chair, and that is absolutely fine. I myself sit on a chair, uh, and I've been sitting on a chair for quite a while. I know plenty of people who do sit on the chair. Uh, there's no need to regard oneself as sort of second-class uh, meditators just because we sit on chairs. You can sit perfectly well on a chair. In fact, I would even go so far as to say uh, it's better to sit uh, well on a chair than, than badly on a cushion. So why does it matter? I mean, apart from somebody requiring to as in a Zen do, if we're sitting on our own, does it really matter? In the long term, I would say yes, it does, because uh, having one knee off the ground makes your form quite unstable. Um, and it means that your body will be having to compensate for that instability. If you think about it, uh, if you're sitting properly, you, you form a triangle with your buttocks and your two knees. Uh, and that's a very stable position. Uh, it's why photographers place their cameras uh, on 
tripods when they're doing panning shots or uh, long exposures or something like that because it is it's very stable. Uh, the body moves even when we're sitting still the body moves the the muscles in the body there are micro movements uh, because the body's continuously stabilizing itself and if we're uh, if we if we're unstable because uh, there's only two points touching the ground and the third isn't then usually the back has to compensate for it uh, and that can produce overdevelopment of the muscles along one side um, and you know it's it can provide it, it can in some cases uh, bring on extra aches and pains and uh, there are enough aches and pains in zazen uh, without bringing extra ones on so if you if you do find that you can't get both knees on the ground don't worry just uh, 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 sit on a chair or, or sit astride uh, try that uh, and again, just give yourself time to adjust to the new position. The other alternative is, I mean, unless you've got some kind of uh, problem with your hip or, or something like that, you know, some uh, stretching exercises, yoga, obviously, anything that stretches or lengthens the muscles and the ligaments and so forth, uh, you may find helps. Uh, and it's not uncommon anyway for people who start Sarzen to find that they can't sit uh, comfortably, that they're not that elastic or flexible. Well, again, you know, uh, work at it, be patient, work at it, and you may well find that over time you can do it. Uh, so good luck. Um, so the second question um, also has to do with, uh, this time not with our posture, but which way to face. Why is it that some uh, places sit facing the wall and some places sit facing inwards? And does this matter? Well, this difference arises uh, because of the two main schools of Zen. Uh, there's Rinzai Zen um, and there's Soto Zen. And Soto Zen, uh, they tend to sit facing the wall and this mirrors the story of the first patriarch Bodhidharma who also sat for a number of years facing the wall of a cave uh, and so they, they emulate that and this really has to do in a more sort of symbolic way of, of facing the wall one is facing oneself really and this is the obstacle that needs to be overcome of course uh, the letting go uh, of the attachment to self. Uh, the other school, Rinzai, they tend to sit facing inwards and the reason that they do that is because their obstacle is the master. If we know, as we know, the Rinzai school um, practices formal koans uh, and so the master becomes the obstacle for the student. Uh, the master sits in the meditation hall and so uh, they sit facing inwards, in other words, symbolically facing him. Uh, so, yes, I mean, there's a story behind both of them. Uh, is one better? Is one worse? No, no I don't think, re re not really. Uh, it's a matter of form. Um, the important thing is to, to sit and to sit well. Uh, so, uh, facing in or facing the wall just depends whose zendo it is we're actually sitting in. And, of course... You know, if you're a Rinzai person and you're visiting a Soto place, uh, we, in either or vice versa, uh, we conform to the home environment. We conform to the environment that we are actually sitting in. So that's the rule. Number three, do I have to bow to the cushion? <clears throat> well, if again, if you're in a Zendo, yes, you will. And you'll also have to bow when you go in, and you have to do it in a certain way, which you will be shown. Uh, but what about when we're at home? Does it really matter? I mean, uh, can we just plonk ourselves down on a cushion? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, yes, the answer is yes, of course. We can just plonk ourselves down on the cushion and sit Zazen, and then when we have finished, get up and go. But um, I think the right question would be, is there, uh, is there a benefit to doing this? Uh, and personally, I would argue most definitely, yes, there is. Uh, bowing, first of all, has uh, spiritual and religious connotations, which is possibly why some people don't like it very much. But it's useful. It's useful if one can sort of overcome that uh, feeling that some people do have a, a, against religion, a sort of antithesis against it, uh, because Buddhism is a religion and Zen Buddhism is also 
a religion. Certainly the people who practice it in Japan and uh, in Taiwan and in um, you know Vietnam or uh, in Southeast Asia uh, think of it as a religion and a religious practice uh, and so bowing is is quite natural it's a handing over of myself and let's not forget that uh, our, the heart or core of our practice is to give myself or hand myself over uh, into what at this moment is being done sort of literally make an offering of myself um, but the other thing that I think that it's it's useful for and I remember this was brought up uh, recently with, with, with somebody uh, I was talking with and and they found that the bowing before and bowing afterwards not only gave a sense of gratitude which is a, a, a an important aspect of practice uh, because it it takes us out of ourselves a little bit uh, but it also creates what's what's called a temenos or a sacred space uh, within which we sit. If, if we think about the principle of sitting meditation, what is it that we're doing? Well, you know, I mean, if we go back years, um, originally people used to go to remote places in order to seek, uh, you know, visions, spiritual enlightenment, uh, experience the transcendent, uh, put it, which find God, put it, in whatever terminology uh, we like, people will go to these remote places, whether it's deserts, whether it's the forest, whether it's the mountain, um, away. So there was this sense of, of retreating from the world. And in effect, that is what we're doing when we're sitting down in meditation as well. We are, uh, uh, just for a temporary period, we are leaving our usual world behind us. Um, the thoughts, our con my concerns, uh, my hopes and fears, etc. Although, of course, um, we have plenty of those that come up on the cushion. Uh, but the practice itself is allowing us to just declutch from all that for a period of time even if it's for nothing more than just to have a rest and recharge uh, then it's that but obviously uh, the deeper we go uh, then actually we're beginning to go into uh, to look at the nature of consciousness and mind and uh, uh, see into the nature of things as they really are which is what uh, the practice of Buddhism is is about so if we're if we're serious about doing that, then we, it is important to create a, a place and a time uh, within which to do this. And, and because when we retreat, obviously, we, it's not just a case of leaving somewhere. We might not be able to go very far, just to the corner of, our, of, of a bedroom or uh, something like that. Um, but the other thing is also we're taking time out. And the bowing is is so to speak it, it's like passing through a doorway into that temenos into that sacred space which then we within which we sit and then when we're finished and we're ready to re-enter the world we bow once again uh, and before re-entering it so it's that they're like marker posts really and perhaps if we look at it like that uh, then it will make some sense to what we are doing it will uh, add some meaning uh, to to what we're doing and, and it's interesting because we find that those ritual acts even if they're unspoken do have a real world effect on consciousness so you know e experiment with those if you're not used to doing so you might find it has a serious effect I, I certainly remember I mean I used to go and sit at the Buddhist Society in London well I still do um, and, and I have to say that the building itself entering the building you know the atmosphere of the building hits uh, as soon as we pass through the doorway um, and by the time we get onto the cushion we're already, you know, I'm already, you know, uh, two thirds of the way into Zazen. And that's just because I've done it for years and years. Uh, and how the, the heart mind associates the place and the time um, with the practice that is done within those four walls. So, um, yeah, experiment, please. Uh, so the next one um, has to do also with uh, forms. The next two questions, actually. Uh, one is to do with the tongue and teeth. So, yes, this has to do when, when we've set up the body. Uh, traditionally, 
uh, when we sit we breathe in and out through the nose uh, now in certain yogic practices uh, the we breathe in through the nose and we may breathe out through the mouth or we may breathe in through one nostril and breathe out through another holding the unused one closed etc this is a practice known as pranayana uh, very old uh, and venerable practice but it's not something that we practice in zazen it's it's different the breath is allowed to be itself uh, and we follow the breath uh, so instead of exerting control over it um, I give myself into it uh, a little bit like instead of leading the dance we follow um, and and that means that obviously the mouth is going to be closed uh, uh, and the jaw is uh, uh, closed as well but the teeth are not clenched otherwise that makes tension in the jaw which can be painful after a time and it also brings tension into the practice too. Uh, traditionally the tongue touches the upper palate behind the top teeth um, you know, I mean, ugh, nobody's going to be x-raying your mouth uh, during Zazen, so no one will really know. Uh, but yeah, traditionally, that is the form. Um, I guess it's the one that's most comfortable uh, for a long period of time. And really, that's probably what I would say. Whilst Whilst some of these details may seem a bit fussy um, and so some of them certainly are done for ritual purposes because they are meaningful in some way they're also done because over a long period of time they have found that if you're going to sit for you know long periods and for many years that, that it's the best way to do it it really is uh, you know ancient wisdom and all that so yeah don't don't pre you know we're very easy at make it's very easy to make a priori judgments about things uh, quite often in, in in buddhism and certainly in zen uh, very little is explained uh, we in the west are terrible we talk a lot just like i'm doing now um, and we love giving talks and writing reams and reams and reams but actually if you go to a traditional training monastery you're told very little you're just expected to conform and you're judged on your ability to do that and uh, we may see sort of gosh you know that's all sort of it's very blind isn't it i thought it was about seeing clearly but the thing is actually it's not it's not blind it's about seeing for oneself so yes it's blind when we begin with but if we are present if we're giving ourselves into the practice and we are present in the here and now we begin to notice the effects that these things have and we find out for ourselves um, and and that's something believe it or not we're not very good at we tend to you know think that we know things before we've really tested them or tried them out we're, particularly with our opinions and our convictions even more so um, <clears throat> what about the eyes? Oh yes, the eyes. Uh, so the eyes, uh, we're not looking around the room and neither do we have them closed. There are some meditations where the eyes are closed, but not in Zazen. Uh, they may be closed for meditations that include visualization, although not always. Um, but for this form of Zazen, which is basically... Uh, anapanasati that is a meditation on the breath of one sort or another um, then the eyes are are half open half closed and that's to reduce the sensory visual sensory inputs so that we don't get distracted uh, so that we can rest and relax into the practice of zazen uh, but the eyes are not closed so that we're not then prone to fall asleep or uh, drift off into daydreams quite as much um, yeah put that caveat on there so generally what uh, uh, the instruction is simply to look down you know just at a space in front um, and as we look down the eyelids naturally come down and partially close uh, and that's it really not to think too much about it it's not a case of focusing or defocusing this, if, if, we're fi if we're finding ourselves fretting a little bit about this, then it's not the eyes that's the problem, it's me. Uh, because I'm feeling self-conscious about them and I'm possibly trying to get them right. Uh, and, I'm, uh, uh, and, and this then is the passion. So in that case, forget about the eyes and go with the upset. Go with the feeling of upset. 
take a breath into that and as we do with all the other emotional reactions when they come up um, they're allowed space within where is that uh, upset uh, located we just open up the body to it take a breath in and just sit with it you know sit with that upset for as long as it sits it won't last forever and self-consciousness is an emotional state just like anger just like desire just like uh, anything else uh, uh, just like any other passion so uh, it will come and it will go uh, the eyes if we just look down they will they know what to do thank goodness okay next question counting or not counting well um, again this depends whose school you whose zendo you've been to uh, some places they they don't uh, I remember the very first Zazen I was taught, there was no counting, it was just following the breath. There are forms of following the breath, sometimes uh, the focus is on the entry and exit of the breath through the nose, sometimes it's on the abdomen, sometimes it's on what's called the hara, uh, which is this, uh, a place just below the navel that's been also used in Zen actually as well in some forms. Uh, some, some schools that emphasize it a little bit more, others don't um, and at, but the next the, the uh, when I came back to the practice of it because I left for a while when I came back to it I was taught putting a count on the breath and giving myself into the count on the breath and uh, the reason I was told for that and it's true is that uh, by allowing that bit of a thought that one to in this case it was putting a, a count onto the out breath by putting a, a by putting that count onto an out breath breath it just gave i um, a little bit of something to do but not not too much and and just enough to uh, hopefully provide that focus uh, uh, without then disappearing off into the multifarious thought streams so um yeah, I'm, I mean, again, it depends where you go. It depends um, who's taught you. Um, again, really, this comes down to the fact that, you know, if you're given a practice, do it. Uh, rather than sort of giving yourself options all the time. You know, part of, part of this practice is to give up that picking and choosing. And uh, when it comes, you know, if, if we go to a teacher and a teacher says, right, these are the instructions, then, you know, there's no point sort of saying, well, you know, I want you to teach me, but I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. Um, because that's not going to work. It's not going to work and it won't be appreciated either uh, in the long term. Um it doesn't solve much of the problem. Again, a lot of it is quite often down to either very hasty judgments about things or uh, judgments about things made even a priori, even without trying them. Um, the thing with the body and the thing even with the mind is that they are both very flexible and very adaptable, but they require time. Again, it's like with that knee on the ground, that second knee on the ground. It's amazing what you can do if you practice and if you give something time. Um, you know, we're more flexible than we imagine. Uh, but a little bit if we're impatient and we're expecting things, you know, now, then we might not discover that. So, yeah, go along with things as they are. Uh, in the place where you're training, but you know these are these are all practices on the breath. Really, all the schools of Buddhism, uh, you'll find this. The Theravadans do it, Tibetans do it. Um, you know, there's uh, this is what's known as the Shamatha meditation, or the tranquilizing or the quietening meditation. Very powerful practice, uh, which is why it's used so ubiquitously. Next question is uh, how long should we sit for and how often should we do it? Um, well, some people I know sit about 10 minutes meditation a day. To be honest, I think that's a bit short. Uh, I mean, it's all right to start with. 
uh, whilst you're getting yourself used to it. And I know some people may find sitting still very difficult if they're just not used to it. Uh, but really build up to half an hour. Um, everybody should be able to sit half an hour comfortably given a chance. Uh, ideally, build up to an hour. But if you do build up to an hour, give yourself a little break in the middle um, as so that you can just uh, move about a little bit. Stay on the cushion or stay on your seat, but just give yourself, you allow yourself to stretch a little bit for a couple of minutes and then go back and sit the rest of that hour. Um, and that way we get used to it. The thing is, uh, even with, um, with half an hour, um, but the, you know, it takes about 10 minutes really to, uh, really settle in, uh, and hardly have you settled in. And then, you know, uh, in the last 10 minutes, you're beginning to think about what you're going to be doing afterwards. So it doesn't give you very long in the middle to, to sit deeply. Uh, whereas if you sit for an hour, it's a little bit too, you know, you can settle down and it's long enough so that you, you're not thinking about the end of it. Um, until the end uh, so it gives you longer sitting more deeply so um, and as for ha uh, how many days a week you should do it um, I was always advised to sit six days a week and that's because we were always uh, uh, told to take one day off the practice completely and that was really to avoid over attachment to it you know this is all Buddhism this is all about um, letting go um, and so avoiding the extremes but, you know, some people I know find that very difficult to stay to that commitment if you've got other commitments, family, children, and so on. Um, and uh, do what you can. Um, you know, I remember somebody coming up and saying, look, I, I really can't commit. And I said, well, can you commit? How many days a week can you commit? And they said, one. So I said, fine, just sit one day a week, but sit that day, you know. Tell the family you're going to do it uh, and do it and do it. Uh, it's the discipline of it that's really important and obviously as I said if other opportunities come up then use them uh, but you stick to that minimum you know um, if you can't do the whole of it do some of it it's better than doing nothing um, the next one is also a related question what do I do if you know the household just isn't conducive to sitting uh, the kids won't let me or you know um, family etc or maybe it's uh, uh, sharing a house and uh, you know sharing a room as well. Uh, I haven't got a venue for it. Well, this does require a little bit more creativity, uh, obviously. But you know, um, Daito Kokushi, who sat for 20 years under the fifth bridge in Kyoto, uh, always made the point that you should be able to sit zazen in all circumstances and in all places. So. You know, there are quiet places around. If you live in a town or you live in a city, there are churches. Uh, I've sat Zazen in a church before. They're great places to sit. They really are. Um, they're, they're perfect. I mean, you walk in and again, you're, you're straight into the Temenos, straight into that sacred space. Um, you know, don't worry about the fact that it's, uh, oh, well, you know, I'm not a Christian. Most churches overwhelming number of churches don't mind at all they are very happy for you uh, to use the space for a spiritual practice or for no practice for just coming in and sitting quietly you know um, I remember the Archbishop of Canterbury once saying you know no one's going to stand at the door and ask you about your beliefs no one so if you want to go in just go in don't feel uh, that it's uh, a problem at all. Uh, they're great places to sit, but I've also sat on park benches too. Um, you know, obviously when it's not raining and when it's not uh, freezing cold. Um, I have actually even sat on buses and tube trains as well. Uh, so, yeah, uh, take advantage really of that morning commute. Uh, it doesn't have to look strange. You don't even have to sit very formally or formally at all. Uh, there's a knack to it, and it's probably better if you do have an opportunity to sit in a zendo uh, or with a group of people. 
because that at least that at least gives you a conducive basis on upon which to work. But yeah, it's true. You you do have to get a little bit creative in that uh, uh, if the circumstances don't allow. But the final thing I would really say is, look, the whole point, the whole thing about Buddhism is that everything is subject to change, and you, so are your circumstances. If you're finding it difficult to sit now. Um, you will find in time those circumstances change. You know, children grow up. Um, people move from one place to another. So you might be in shared accommodation now, but, you know, it's unlikely that you will be for the whole of your life. So uh, the practice is, you know, it's a long-term practice. It's a lifelong practice. So don't give up hope. Um, stay with the difficult circumstances, uh, develop skillful means within those circumstances to do your best. Uh, and that's all you can do. They, they don't have, the situation doesn't have to be perfect in order to practice Zazen. And in fact, if you learn to do Zazen sitting on a bus um, uh, on the morning commute, um, you'll find that when you f do finally have that conducive temenos, uh, you'll be able to sit a lot more deeply because you'll have gained a lot more stamina with your perseverance. So, uh, good luck uh, with that and uh, look forward to being able to field a few questions in these uh, troubleshooting sessions. Remember, the Zen Gateway at gmail.com. <laughs> Bhūjī-sokha-hanyāshin <laughs>